Om Hridaya Kamala Madhye Rajitam Nirvikalpam Sarasatakila Beda Tika Meka Swarupam Prakriti Vikriti Shunyam Nityam Ananda Murtim Vimala Paramaham Sam Ramakrishnam Bajamaha Nirupama Mati Sukshmam Nishprapancham Nihiham Gagana Satrisham Isham Sarva Bhutati Vasam Triguna Rahita Satchit Brahma Rupam Varenyam Vimala Paramahamsam Ramakrishnam Bajamaha Vitaritum Avatirnam Jnana Bhakti Prashanti Pranaya Galata Chittam Jiva Dukkha Sahishnu Dritta Saja Samadim Chinmayam Komalangam Bhimala Paramahamsam Ramakrishnam Bajamaha Meditation on Sri Ramakrishna. This knower of Brahman, ever established in his own nature, full of wisdom, self-possessed and self-lighted, eternal, the very image of that Brahman who is pure bliss, shining ceaselessly in the lotus of the heart, one alone and without parts, pure and still, this Ramakrishna, Paramatman Supreme, we adore. Subtle, fine and luminous, not even the shadow of the gross can ever reach him, for his purity is without parallel. Untouched by Maya's webs of deceit, beyond the dark rivers of time and desire, vast as the sky, this Supreme Lord, the very essence of Brahman as existence and light, this Ramakrishna, Paramatman Supreme, we adore. Saturated with divine consciousness, his home is in all. He hears every cry. He knows every pain. Under the weight of its compassion, his heart can deny the need of none. Born to raise the world with teachings of knowledge, love, and peace. Born to bring mankind fresh songs of joy. This certain refuge of all, this Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, Paramatman Supreme, we adore. So the way I've been doing this is I've um, been taking some of the stories of the young boys who were there at the time that uh, they were just coming to see Sri Ramakrishna, many of them for the first time. And they later became his disciples and um, some of them became president of the order and uh, anyhow, there are different stories about them. But just to give you a little background on some of the people, I've been taking one and reading just a bit from the beginning of their lives um, to start off with. So this one is about Swami Adbhutananda, uh, who was also called Latu. Ramchandra Datta, Latu's employer, was one of the first disciples to come to Sri Ramakrishna. And having a devotional nature, Ramchandra loved to speak about the master, which enkindled Latu's pa passionate love for God. One day, Latu heard Ramchandra repeating some of Ramakrishna's teachings, quote, God sees into the mind of a man without concern for what he is or where he is. He who yearns for God wants none other than God. To such a man, God reveals himself. One should call on him with a simple and innocent heart. Without sincere longing, none can see God. One should pray to him in solitude and weep for him. Only then will he bestow his mercy." End of quote. These words impressed Latu greatly, 
and he could sometimes be found lying covered with his blanket, quietly wiping tears from his eyes. He eagerly awaited for an opportunity to see Ramakrishna. One Sunday, it was either late in 1870 or early in 1880, while Ramchandra was getting ready to go to Dakshineswar, Latu asked him, would you take me with you? I want to see Ramakrishna. Observing Latu's earnestness, Ramchandra agreed. And when the master saw Latu, he asked Ramchandra, Ram, did you bring this boy with you? Where did you find him? I see some holy signs in him. Ramakrishna asked Latu to sit down and begin to speak about ever free souls. The knowledge of those who are ever free souls only needs to be unveiled as it were. They are like an underground spring which remains covered until a stonemason digging the earth <laughs> removes a particular rock and then the water will begin to flow. Saying this, he touched Latu and the boy went into an ecstatic state. Tears trickled from his eyes and his lips began to quiver with emotion. This continued for an hour. At last, the master touched Latu and he slowly returned to the normal state of consciousness. From the very beginning, the master recognized Latu's divinity and pure nature, which he had verified by touching him. When Ramchandra and Latu were about to return to Calcutta, Ramakrishna said, please send Latu here from time to time. The boys, Latu's body returned to Calcutta, but his mind remained in Dakshineswar. After his first meeting with the master, Latu began finding it difficult to work for Ramchandra. After a few weeks, in February of 1880, Ramchandra expressed a desire to send some sweets and fruits to the master. And Latu immediately said, Sir, I'm very willing to carry your things to the master. Latu walked six miles alone to Dakshineswar with sweets and fruits, and he met the master on the garden path and bowed down to him, jubilant. Then he visited the temple deities and returned to the master, and he remained with the master for the whole day. After his second visit to Sri Ramakrishna, Latu lost all interest in his job. He said, I don't want to have a job anymore. I want to stay here and serve you. But I will not be here, said the master. I'm going to Kamarpukur. When I return, you can come. After eight long months, Sri Ramakrishna returned to Dakshineswar. And one day, Ramchandra again sent Latu to the temple garden with some fruits and sweets for the master. After supper at the master's request, Latu began to massage his feet. And after a while, he began to weep. Ramakrishna asked, why are you weeping? What has happened to you? Latu stayed at Dakshineswar for three days. He did not want to return. Ram Chandra said, you have turned this boy's head with your love. In June of 1881, Hride, a nephew of the master, who had served and attended him for many years, left Dakshineswar. Ram Chandra immediately sent Latu to serve the master in his place. Two days later, Ramchandra himself came to Dakshineswar, and the master said to him, permit this boy to stay here. He's a very pure soul. And Ramchandra willingly agreed. Latu would never begin his day without first seeing Ramakrishna and saluting him. One morning, for some reason, he didn't see the master when he first woke up, and he shouted, where are you? Wait a minute, I'm coming, Ramakrishna answered. Latu kept his hands tightly pressed to his eyes until the master came. Then he took away his hands and bowed down to his feet. So this is one of the boys who came during the time of the writing of the gospel. And he actually was blessed by being able to serve Sri Ramakrishna as a personal attendant. So the page we're on now is 342. And it's um, with the devotees in Dakshin as far as the name of the chapter. This is Sunday, December 16th, 1883. So it was right around this time that Latu had come. 
Sri Ramakrishna was seated with M on the semicircular porch of his room at about 10 o'clock in the morning. The fragrance of gardenias, jasmine, oleander, roses, and other flowers filled the air. The master was singing, looking at M. If you've been to um, Dakshin S4, you, you know that there are lots and lots of beautiful bushes with flowers, and the gardenias there grow like this. They're huge, and they're very beautiful. It's a beautiful garden. So he was looking at him and singing, Thou must save me, sweetest mother. Unto thee I come for refuge, helpless as a bird imprisoned in a cage. I have done in unnumbered wrongs, and aimlessly I roam about, misled by Maya's spell, bereft of wisdom's light, comfortless as a mother cow whose calf has wandered away. Master, but why? Why should I live like a bird imprisoned in a cave? Five, for shame. As the master said these words, he went into an ecstatic mood. His body became motionless and his mind stopped functioning. Tears streamed down his cheeks, and after a while he said, Oh, mother, make me like Sita, completely forgetful of everything, body and limbs, totally unconscious of hands and feet and sense organs, with only the one thought in her mind, where is Rama? Was the master inspired by the ideal of Sita to teach M the yearning that a devotee should feel for God? Sita's very life was centered in Rama. Completely absorbed in the thought of Rama, Sita forgot even her body, which is so dear to all. At four o'clock in the afternoon, Mr. Mukherjee, a relative of Pran Krishna, arrived in the company of a Brahmin well-versed in the scriptures. Mukherjee, I'm very happy to meet you, sir. Master, God dwells in all beings. He is the gold in all. In some places, it is more clearly manifest than in others. God dwells in the worldly-minded, no doubt, but he's hidden there, like gold under a deep layer of clay. Mukherjee, sir, what is the difference between worldly and otherworldly things? Master, while striving for the realization of God, the aspirant has to practice renunciation, applying the logic of neti neti, not this, not this. But after attaining the vision of God, he realizes that God alone has become all things. At one time, Rama was overpowered by the spirit of renunciation. Dasarata, worried at this, went to the sage Vashishta and begged him to persuade Rama not to give up the world. The sage came to Rama and found him gloomy, in a gloomy mood. The fire of intense renunciation had been raging in the prince's mind. Vashishta said, Rama, why should you renounce the world? Is the world outside of God? Reason with me. Rama realized that the world had evolved from the Supreme Brahman, so he said nothing. Buttermilk is made from the same substance as butter. One who realizes this knows that butter goes without buttermilk and buttermilk with butter. After separating the butter with great effort, that is to say, after attaining Brahmagyana, you will realize that as long as butter exists, buttermilk also must exist. Wherever there is butter, there must be buttermilk as well. As long as one feels that Brahman exists, one must also be aware that the universe living beings and the 24 cosmic principles exist as well. What Brahman is cannot be described in words. Everything has been polluted, like food that is touched by the tongue. That is, everything has been described in words, 
but no one has been able to describe Brahman. It is therefore unpolluted. I said this to Vidyasagar, and he was delighted. But the knowledge of Brahman cannot be realized if the aspirant is worldly-minded, even in the slightest degree. He succeeds in acquiring this knowledge only when his mind is totally free from woman and gold. Parvati once said to her father, Father, seek the company of holy men if you want the knowledge of Brahman. Addressing Mr. Mukherjee, Ramakrishna said, You are rich, and still you call on God. That's very good indeed. It is said in the Gita that those who fall from the path of yoga are born in their next birth as devotees as God, of God in rich families. Mr. Mukherjee quoted the line from the Gita. Master, God, if he, also, he desires, can keep a jnani in the world too. The world and all living beings have been created by his will, but he is self-willed. Mukherjee with a smile. How can God have any will? Does he lack anything? Master with a smile. What is wrong in that? Water is water, whether it is still or in waves. The snake is a snake, whether it is coiled up motionless or wiggles along. The man is the same man, whether sitting still or in action. How can you eliminate from the reality the universe and its living beings? If you do that, it will lack its full weight. You cannot find the total weight of a bell fruit if you eliminate the seeds in the shell. Brahman is unattached. One finds good and bad smells in the air, but the air itself is untainted. Brahman and Shakti are identical, but is it the primordial power that has become the world and all living beings. Mukherjee, why does one deviate from the path of yoga? Master, as the saying goes, in my mother's womb, I was in a state of yoga. Coming into the world, I have eaten its clay. The midwife has cut the shackle, the navel cord. But how shall I cut the shackle of Maya? Maya is nothing but woman and gold. A man attains yoga when he has freed his mind from these two. The self, the supreme self, is the magnet. The individual self is the needle. The individual self experiences the state of yoga when it is attracted by the supreme self to itself. But the magnet cannot attract the needle if the needle is covered with clay. It can draw the needle only when the clay is removed. The clay of woman and gold must be removed. Mukherjee, how can one remove it? Master, weep for God with a longing heart. Tears shed for him will wash away the clay. When you have thus freed yourself from impurity, you will be attracted by the magnet. Only then will you attain yoga. Ramakrishna often would talk about yearning for God, and if you yearn for God, um, it's like the rosy color before the dawn. You are sure to get help and you're sure to attain. Mukherjee said, priceless words, Master. If a man is able to weep for God, he will see him. He will go into samadhi. Perfection in yoga is samadhi. A man achieves kumbhaka without any yogic exercise if he but weeps for God. The next stage is samadhi. There's another method, that of meditation. In the Sahasrara Shiva manifests himself as a, in a special manner. 
the aspirant should meditate on him. The body is like a tray, the mind and the buddhi are like water. The sun of Satchitananda is reflected in this water. Meditating on the reflected sun, one sees the real sun through the grace of God. But the worldly man must constantly live in the company of holy men. It is necessary for all, even for sannyasis, but it is especially necessary for the householder. His disease has become chronic because he has to live constantly in, this, in the midst of woman and gold. This is, he often refers to this, what he means is lust and greed. Mukherjee, yes, sir, the disease has indeed become chronic. Master, give God the power of attorney. Let him do whatever he wants. Be like a kitten and cry to him with a fervent heart. The mother puts the kitten wherever she wants to. The kitten doesn't know anything. It is left sometimes on the bed, sometimes near the hearth. Mukherjee, it is good to read s s sacred books like the Gita. Master, but what will you gain by mere reading? Some have heard of milk. Some have seen it. But there are some besides who have drunk it. God can indeed be seen. What's more, one can talk to him. The first stage is that of the beginner. He studies and he hears. Second is the stage of the struggling aspirant. He prays to God, he meditates on him, and he sings his name and glories. The third stage is that of the perfected soul. He has seen God, realized him directly, and immediately in his inner consciousness. Last is the state of the supremely perfect, like Chaitanya. Such a devotee establishes a definite relationship with God, looking on him as his son or his beloved. M. Rakal, Yogan, and Latu, and the other devotees were entranced by these words of the di divine realization. Mr. Mukherjee and his friends were taking leave of the master. After saluting him, they stood up. The master also stood up to show them courtesy. Mukherjee smiling, that you should stand up or sit down. Master smiling, but what is the harm? Water is water, whether it is placid or in waves. I am like a cast off leaf in the wind. The wind blows that leaf wherever it lists. I am the machine and God is the operator. Mr. Mukherjee and his friend left the room. M thought, according to the Vedanta, all is like a dream. Are all these, the ego, the universe, the living beings, unreal then? M had studied a little of the Vedanta. He also had read the German philosophers, such as Kant and Hegel, whose writings are only a faint echo of Vedanta. But Sri Ramakrishna did not arrive at his conclusions by reasoning, as do ordinary scholars. It was the Divine Mother of the universe who revealed the truth to him. These were the thoughts that passed through M's mind. He used to um, take notes on the, what he heard during these sessions with Sri Ramakrishna, and then he would go home and meditate on them and develop it. That's how he wrote the gospel. And there's actually, we still have his original notes that he took as he heard these words. It was, he was the one that was meant to write this. Um, I've given you quotes before from both Swamiji and Holy Mother saying that when they first read it, they were really overcome because it was so close to actually being 
with Sri Ramakrishna and listening to his words. A little later, Ramakrishna and M were conversing on the porch west of the master's room. No one else was there. It was late winter afternoon, and the sun had not yet gone below the horizon. So now M has been thinking about his ideas about Vedanta and everything being unreal and trying to reconcile that with Sri Ramakrishna's idea that it was all such an ananda, which he had just stated. Master, why should it be unreal? What you are asking is a matter for philosophical discussion. In the beginning, when a man reasons following the Vedantic method of not this, not this, he realizes that Br Brahman is not the living beings, not the universe, not the 24 cosmic principles. All these things become like dreams to him. And then he comes to the affirmation of what has been de denied. And he feels that God himself has become the universe and all living beings. Suppose you are climbing on the roof by the stairs. As long as you are aware of the roof, you're also aware of the stairs. He who is aware of the high is also aware of the low. But after reaching the roof, you realize that the stairs are made of the same materials, brick, lime, and brick dust, as the roof itself. Further, I've given the illustration of the bell fruit. Both changeability and unchangeability belong to one and the same reality. The ego cannot be done away with. As long as I consciousness exists in living beings, and the, then the universe must also exist. After realizing God, one sees that it is he himself who has become the universe and the living beings. But one cannot realize this by mere reasoning. It's an experience. It's not something intellectual that you can argue and you know, make your points about. It's an experience. Shiva has two states of mind. First, the state of samadhi, when he is transfixed in the great yoga. Then, is, he is atma rama, satisfied in the self. So this is like the meditating Shiva that we see pictures of. Second, the state when he descends from samadhi, and keeps a trace of the ego. And then he dances about ch chanting Rama Rama. So this is like the Nataraj and the creation of the whole um, of creation. Did the master describe Shiva to him at his own, to hint at the his own state of mind? This is a question that M is asking himself. It was evening. Sri Ramakrishna was meditating on the Divine Mother and chanting her holy name. The devotees also went off to solitary places and meditated on their chosen ideals. Evening worship began in the temple garden, in the shrines of Kali, Radha Krishna, and Shiva. It was the second day of the dark fortnight of the moon. Soon the moon rose in the sky, bathing the temple trees, flowers, and rippling surface of the Ganges in its light. The master was sitting on a couch, and M on the floor. The conversation turned to the Vedanta. Master to M. Why should the universe be unreal? That is a spe the speculation of the philosophers. After realizing God, one sees that it's God himself who has become the universe and all the living beings. The Divine Mother revealed to me in the Kali Temple that it was she who had become everything. She showed me that everything was full of consciousness. The image was consciousness. The altar was consciousness. 
the water vessels were consciousness. The door, door still was consciousness. The marble floor was consciousness. All was consciousness. I found everything inside the room soaked, as it were, in bliss, the bliss of Satchitananda. I saw a wicked man in front of the Kali temple, but in him also I saw the power of the Divine Mother vibrating. That was why I fed a cat with the food that was to be offered to the Divine Mother. I clearly perceived that the Divine Mother herself had become everything, even the cat. The manager of the temple wrote to Mathur Babu saying that I was feeding the cat with the offerings intended for the Divine Mother. But Mathur Babu had insight into the state of my mind. He wrote back to the manager, let him do whatever he likes. You must not say anything to him. After realizing God, one sees all this aright that it is he who has become the universe, living beings, and the 24 cosmic principles. But what remains when God completely faces the ego cannot be described in words. As Ram Prasad said in one of his songs, then alone will, will you know whether you are good or I am good. I get even into that state now and then. A man sees a thing in one way through reasoning and in an altogether different way when God himself shows it to him. Monday, December 17th, 1883. It was about 8 o'clock in the e morning. Sri Ramakrishna was in his room with M when Dr. Madhu arrived and sat down beside the master on the small couch. He was an elderly man and full of wit. He used to visit the master when the latter felt indisposed. Master, the whole thing in a nutshell is that one must develop ecstatic love for Satchitananda what kind of love? How should one love God? Gauri used to say that one becomes like Sita to understand Rama, like Bhagavati, the Divine Mother, to understand Bhagavan, Shiva. One must practice austerity as Bhagavati did in order to attain Shiva. One must cultivate the attitude of Prakriti in order to realize Purusha, the attitude of a friend, a handmaid, or a mother. So these are the um, different attitudes that people often take in, if you're following the bhakti path in relationship to God. Friend, handmaiden, or the mother and the child, Gopala, Krishna. I saw Sita in a vision I found that her entire mind was concentrated on Rama. She was totally indifferent to everything, her hands, her feet, her clothes, her jewels. It seemed that Rama had filled every bit of her life, and she could not remain alive without Rama. M. Yes, sir, she was mad with love for Rama. Master, mad, that is the word. One must become mad with love in order to realize God. But that love is not possible if the mind dwells on woman and gold, lust and greed. Sex life with a woman? What happens is, what happiness is there in that? The realization of God gives 10 million times more happiness. Gori used to say that when a man attains ecstatic love of God, all the pores of his skin, even the roots of the hair, become like so many sexual organs, and every pore the aspirant enjoys the happiness of communion with the Atman. One must call on God with a longing heart. One must learn from the guru 
how God can be realized. Only if the guru himself has attained perfect knowledge can he show the way. A man gets rid of all desire when he has perfect knowledge. He becomes like a child five years old. Sages like Daitreyi and Jatabharata had the nature of a child. One hears about them, but there were many others like them that the world doesn't hear about. Master, yes, the jnani gets rid of all desire. If any is left, it does not hurt him. At the touch of the philosopher's stone, the sword is transformed into gold. Then that sword cannot do any killing. Just so, the jnani keeps only the semblance of anger and passion. They are anger and passion only in name. They can't injure him. M. Yes, sir. The jnani goes beyond the three gunas, as you say. He's not under the control of any of the gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas. All these three are so many robbers, as it were. Master, yes, one must assimilate that. M. In this world, there are perhaps not more than three or four men of perfect knowledge. Master, why do you say that? One sees many holy men and sannyasis in the monasteries of Upper India. M. Well, I too can become a sannyasi like one of those. The master fixed his gaze on M and said, by renouncing everything? M. What can a man achieve unless one gets rid of maya? What will a man attain by merely becoming a sannyasi if he cannot subdue maya? Both remained silent for a few minutes. M. Sir, what is the nature of the divine love transcending the three gunas? Master, attaining that love, the devotee sees everything as full of spirit and consciousness. To him, Krishna is consciousness, and his sacred abode is also consciousness. The devotee, too, is consciousness. Everything is consciousness. Very few people attain such love. Dr. Madhu, the love transcending the three gunas means, in other words, that the devotee is not under the control of any of the gunas. Master smiling, yes, that is it. He becomes like a child five years old, not under the control of any gunas. It's said that often the illumined souls and holy men like to have small children around them because they remind them of that state of freedom. The master was resting after his noon meal. Mani Malak arrived and saluted him. Sri Ramakrishna remained lying on the couch and said a word or two to, to, to Mani. Mani, I hear you visited Keshab Sen. Master, yes, how is he now? Mani, he hasn't recovered to any extent from his illness. Master, I found him to be very rajasic. I had to wait a long time before I could see him. The master sat up on the couch and continued his conversation with the devotees. Master to M. I became mad for Rama. I used to walk about carrying an image of Ram Lala given to me by a monk. That was a boy Rama, with that image. I bathed it, fed it, laid it down to sleep. I carried it wherever I went. 
I became mad for Ram Lala. That's the end of that chapter. So Sri Ramakrishna um, went through lots of different disciplines and he relates these in these stories in the gospel. Like that one, he, he was um, worshiping the boy Rama in an image and carrying it with him. But he also studied Vedanta under Totapuri and had that kind of realization. He had many different teachers, including a woman um, teacher who taught him Tantra, I think. Yeah, we have a little Ramal and we have a little baby Krishna up there. If you get up close, you can see them. And we have a standing Krishna with a flute. So this is the beginning of a new chapter, chapter 17, Emma Dakshineswar, Tuesday, December 18th, 1883. Sri Ramakrishna was seated in his room with his devotees. He spoke highly of Devendranath Tagore's love of God and renunciation, and that said, pointing to Rakhal and the other young devotees, Devendra is a good man, but blessed indeed are these young aspirants who, like Sukhdev, practice renunciation from their very boyhood and think of God day and night without being involved in worldly life. The worldly man always has some desire or other, though at times he shows much devotion to God. Once Mathur Babu was entangled in a lawsuit, he said to me in the shrine of Kali, Sir, please offer this flower to the Divine Mother. I offered it unsuspectingly, but he firmly believed that he would attain his objective if, he, if I offered the flower. That means in his lawsuit. It was a winter morning, and the master was sitting near the east door of his room, wrapped in a moleskin shawl. He looked at the sun and suddenly went into samadhi. His eyes stopped blinking, and he lost consciousness of the outer world. After a long time, he came down to the plane of the sense world. Rakal, Hazar, and M, and other devotees were seated near him, master to Hazra. The state of samadhi is certainly inspired by love. Once at Shambazar, they arranged a kirtan at Nabavar Goswami's house. There I had a vision of Krishna and the gopis of Vrindavan. I felt that my subtle body was walking at Krishna's heels. I went into samadhi when similar devotional songs were sung at the Harishabha at Jora Shanko in Calcutta. That day, they feared I might give up the body. After the master had finished his bath, he again spoke of the ecstatic love of the gopis. He said to M and the other devotees, one should accept the fervent attachment of the gopis to their beloved Krishna. Sing songs like this. Tell me, O oh friend, how far is the grove? Where Krishna, my beloved, dwells? His fragrance reaches me even here but I am tired and can walk no farther. Again he sang, I'm not going home, O oh friend, for there it is hard for me to chant my Krishna's name. Sri Ramakrishna had vowed to offer a green coconut and sugar to Sideshwari, the Divine Mother, for Rakhal's welfare. He asked him, whether he would pay for the offering. That afternoon, the master, accompanied by M, Rakhal, and some other devotees, set out in a carriage for the temple of Sudeshwari in Calcutta. 
on the way the offerings were purchased. On reaching the temple, the master asked the devotees to offer the fruit and sugar to the Divine Mother. They saw the priests and their friends playing cards in the temple. Sri Ramakrishna said, to play cards in a temple, one should think of God here. From the temple, the master went to Jadu Malik's house. Jadu was surrounded by his admirers, well-dressed dandies. He welcomed the master, master with a smile. Why do you keep so many clowns and flatterers with you? Jadu smiling. That you may liberate them. Everybody laughed. Master, flatterers think that the rich man will loosen his purse strings for them but it's very difficult to get every, anything from him. Once a jackal saw a bullock and would not give up his company, the bullock roamed around and the jackal followed him. The jackal thought, there hangs the bullock's testicles. Sometime or other, they will drop to the ground and I shall eat them up. <laughs> when the bullock slept on the ground, the jackal lay down too. And when the bullock moved about, the jackal followed him. Many days passed in this way, but the bullock's testicles still clung to his body. The jackal went away disappointed. Everybody laughed. That also happens to flatterers. Jadu and his mother served refreshments to Sri Ramakrishna and the devotees. So the next day, Wednesday, December 19th, 1883, it was nine in the morning. Sri Ramakrishna was talking to M near the bell tree at Dakshineswar, this tree under which the master had practiced most austere sadhanas, stood in the northern end of the temple garden. Farther north ran a high wall, and just outside was the government magazine. West of the bell tree was a row of tall pine trees that rustled in the wind. Below the trees flowed the Ganges, and to the south could be seen the sacred go grove of the Panchavati. The dense trees and underbrush hid the temples. No noise of the outside world reached the bell tree. Master to M, but one cannot realize God without renouncing woman and gold, lust and greed. M. Why did not Vashishta say to Rama, O oh Rama, you may renounce the world if the world is outside of God? Master smiling, he said that to Rama, so Rama might destroy Ravana. Rama accepted the life of a householder and married to fulfill that mission. M stood there like a log, stunned and speechless. Sri Ramakrishna went to the Panchavati, and on his way back to his room, M accompanied him. It was then about 10 o'clock. M, sir, is there no spiritual discipline leading to realization of the impersonal God? Master, yes, there is, but the path is extremely difficult. After intense austerities, the rishis of old sometimes realized God as their innermost consciousness and experienced the real nature of Brahman. But how hard they had to work. They went out of their dwellings in the early morning and all day practiced austerities and meditation. Returning home at nightfall, they took a light supper of fruit and roots. But an aspirant cannot exceed it succeed in this form of spiritual discipline if his mind is stained with worldliness, even in the slightest degree. The mind must withdraw totally from all objects of form, taste, smell, touch, and sound. Thus only does it become pure. The pure mind is the same as the pure Atman. But such a mind must be altogether when it becomes pure, one has another experience. One realizes God alone is the doer. I am his instrument. 
One does not feel oneself to be absolutely necessary to others, either in their misery or in their happiness. Once a wicked man beat into unconsciousness a monk who had lived in a monastery, and on regaining consciousness, he was asked about it by his friends. Who is feeding you milk, the monk said. He who beat me is now feeding me. M. Yes, sir, I know that story. Master, it is not enough to know it. One must assimilate its meaning. It is the thought of worldly objects that prevents the mind from going into samadhi. One becomes established in samadhi when one is completely rid of worldliness. It is possible for me to give up this body in samadhi, but I have a slight desire to enjoy the love of God and the company of his devotees. Therefore, I pray for a little attention, I pay a little attention to my body. It's, um, there's a story of a walled-in garden in the middle of a forest, and different people go and discover it. And they climb up on the wall, and the first one who climbs up on the wall, he, he goes, ah, and he jumps in. And the second one does the same thing. But the third one wants to be able to tell other people about it. So he puts a rope around his, his waist, and he ties it to a tree. And then he looks in. And he, too, wants to jump in, but he can't because he's being held. And he gets back out and tells other people what he saw. And that rope is said to be compassion and love for other beings, that that's the one desire that a sadhu, it's legitimate for uh, a sadhu to keep that one desire. And that's what Sri Ramakrishna is saying here. There's another kind of samadhi called Umana Samadhi. One attains it by suddenly gathering the dispersed mind. You understand what that is, don't you? Um, yes, sir. Master, yes. It's a sudden withdrawal of the dispersed mind into the ideal. But that Samadhi doesn't last long. Worldly thoughts intrude and destroy it, and the yogi slips down from his yoga. At Kamarpukur, I've seen the mongoose living in its hole up in a wall. It feels snug there. Sometimes people tie a brick to its tail. Then the pull of the brick makes it come out of its hole. Every time the mongoose tries to be comfortable inside the hole, it has to come out because of the pull of the brick. Such is the effect of brooding on worldly objects, and it makes a yogi stray from the path of yoga. Worldly people may now and then experience samadhi. The lotus blooms, no doubt, when the sun is up, but its petals close up again when the sun is covered over by a cloud. Worldly thoughts is the cloud. M, isn't it possible to develop both jnana and bhakti by the practice of spiritual discipline? M. Through the path of bhakti, a man may attain both. If it is necessary, God gives him knowledge of Brahman. But a highly qualified aspirant may develop both jnana and bhakti at the same time. Such is the case of the Ishwara Kotis, Chaitanya, for example. But the case of an ordinary devotee is different. There are five kinds of light, the light of the lamp, the light of various kinds of fire, the light of the moon, the light of the sun, and lastly, the combined light of the sun moon, and moon. Bhakti is the light of the moon, and jnana, the light of the sun. Sometimes it is seen that the sun can hardly sets when the moon rises in the sky. In an incarnation of God, one sees at the same time the sun of knowledge and the moon 
of love. Can everyone by a mere wish develop knowledge and love at the same time? It depends on the person. One bamboo is more hollow than another. Is it possible to comprehend the nature of God? Can a one seer pot hold five seers of milk? M. But what about the grace of God? Through his grace, a camel can pass through the eye of a needle. Master, but is it possible to obtain God's grace just like that? A beggar may get a penny if he asks for it, but suppose he asks right off for his train fare. How about that? M stood silent. The master, too, remained silent. Suddenly he said, Yes, it is true. Through the grace of God, some may get both jnana and bhakti. So I think I'll, I'll end there. It's a good ending spot. Does anyone have any comments they want to make on this reading? Right then, I'll close with a chant. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purna Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamataya Purnamevavashishate Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Filled with Brahman are the things we see. Filled with Brahman are the things we see not. From out of Brahman floweth all that is. From Brahman all, yet is he still the same. <laughs>